Emily Rudier uh, from York University. And she's going to speak to us about pathways of epigenetic silencing and exercise driven angiogenesis. And so, first, I want to thank the chair, Tara, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present. Uh, some of the reason why I decided to start an independent research project uh, related to studying the pathway of uh, epigenetic silencing in the context of uh, exercise-driven angiogenesis. So um, Ellen discusses that a bit. So we know that with endurance training, we promote angiogenesis in the skeletal muscle. And as we repeat bouts of exercise, we can see in the skeletal muscle that capillarization will increase with the repetition of those bouts of exercise. And this wouldn't be possible without a timely change in expression of genes that are regulating uh, angiogenesis. So today we know pretty well what are the mechanisms that are potentially responsible. There's still a lot to discover, but basically we know what is happening uh, during the first bout of exercise. We know what, that with the increased contractile activity, we have changes into the microenvironment that will probably lead to the regulation of transcription factors or co-activators that are going to modulate the expression of angiogenic uh, genes. But what we know as well is that, okay, if during the very first bout of exercise, uh, the angiogenic genes are highly responsive to the acute bout of exercise, we can see that as training progresses, angiogenesis reach a plateau. And this plateau is reached, even so we are performing exercise at the same relative intensity, so in theory at higher exercise intensity. And uh, at that time, when we repeat those bouts of exercise, what we know is that as we repeat those bouts of exercise, it seems that somehow those angiogenic genes are less responsive to the acute stress of exercise, and Hélène was talking about that a few minutes ago. So. It's not just true for angiogenesis-related genes, it's also true for the old transcriptome within the skeletal muscle. And if you were at the epigenetic session yesterday morning, you would have heard a lot about that. So when we look at an untrained muscle and we perform one bout of exercise, we know from those genome-wide studies that there are more than 1,200 genes are going to be responding to the contractile activity if you collect the muscle four hours post-exercise. Uh, but when you look at what happened in a trained muscle, so in this trained muscle we see we have an increased capillarization, we have probably metabolic adaptation that took place, we perform one bout of exercise and once again in those studies they've they've um, looked at the expression of genes four hours post-exercise, they're only less than 200 genes that are going to respond to the contractile activity, okay? So it's a massive decades. We divide by eight the number of genes that are responding to the acute stress of exercise. So when we compare then a trained muscle and an untrained muscle, so we can see that they are phenotypically different, and this is likely supported by differences in gene expression. And there are many studies that have studied that um, using genome-wide approach and uh, RNA-seq approaches. And when you look at studies that perform training uh, with similar type of, uh, of um, exercise, you can see that at four weeks, there are about more than 800 genes that are differentially regulated. At eight weeks, more than 2,000 genes that are different when we compare trained versus untrained at basal level, so at rest, not after exercise, after a significant washout post-exercise, and then 4,000 genes are differentially regulated at 12 weeks. Those are studies that were done by other investigators, but I still want to highlight them, because to me they are important, because they show that as training progresses, it seems that when we look at, look at the number of genes that are done regulating in those differentially expressed genes, there is kind of um, more genes that appear to be down-regulated as training progresses. So if we summarize those genome-wide approach, um, we can say that as uh, we compare untrained muscles versus trained muscles, uh, we see that there is an increase of the, the proportion of genes that are down-regulated as training progresses. 
But when we look at the responsiveness to contractual activities, at the start of exercise, the skeletal muscle transcriptome is highly responsive to the exercise stress. But with eight weeks of training, we have significantly less genes that are responding to the acute exercise. So this observation from, that I made from reading other um, work from other researchers led me to question, is there an active recruitment of gene silencing in response to exercise training? So today I'm not going to discuss all the mechanisms through which genes could be done regulated in the context of exercise or exercise training. I'm just going to present some of the work I've done in the past and some of the most recent work. I'm going to discuss uh, how potentially protein interaction could lead to uh, the down regulation of genes uh, through the regulation of transcription factor. And I'm also going to discuss some pathways that are uh, important for mirror RNA maturations and some other pathways that are important for establishing silencing epigenetic marks. Um, I'm going to use uh, the example of the pathways that are related to the e 3 butene ligase to discuss some of those concepts. So MGM2 is an e 3 butene ligase that is known to, tar to ubiquitinate its target. It can either stabilize, change the localization, the activity of its target, or trigger it through, um, to, through the proteosomal degradation. But what we know about MDM2 is that when we have mice that express low level of MDM2, they are unable to induce angiogenesis in response to endurance training. So we thought it was an interesting um, pathway to pursue for this reason. MDM2 interact with transcription factor. It's been shown in cancer cells, and we've shown that in endothelial cells as well. Um, MDM2 can interact with FOXO1, can interact with the tumor suppressor P53, and with E1 alpha. And through this interaction, MDM2 has potential capacity uh, to alter the expression of angiogenic genes that are important for skeletal muscle angiogenesis. In this talk, I will also discuss potentially uh, how MDM2 could play a role in gene silencing through its interaction with EZH2, which is important for the establishment of silencing epigenetic marks, and with Drosha, which is important for the mRNA and biogenesis. But at first, I want to discuss some of our old, older work that I was done in collaboration mostly with Tara when I was a research associate in our group and with Olivier Biro as well, where we've shown that uh, MDM2, through its capacity to interact with FOXO1, uh, could potentially downregulate the activity of FOXO1. And I'm not going to discuss that in the context of training, but mainly uh, during the first bout of exercise. So uh, using transgenic mice, uh, there were a muscle-specific depletion of, of uh, VEGF uh, that we obtained uh, through collaboration with Mark. Uh, we were, we've shown in the past that VEGF was required to induce the phosphorylation of MDM2 on the serine 166 in, during an acute bout of exercise. When we look at what happened in the skeletal muscle, uh, we see that uh, after exercise, there is an increase of the phosphorylation of MDM2 that returns to normal level post-exercise. And that phosphorylation is known to activate MDM2 function towards certain of its targets. So, interestingly enough, and that was a work that was done uh, by Daras, uh, who was a master student in, in Dr. Haas lab, so in Tara's lab, we see that two hours post-exercise, we had a stabilization of FOXO1, and, uh, and the downstream target of FOXO1 thrombospondin was, was stabilized two hours post-exercise. So, we also know that towards post-exercise, the phosphorylation of MDM2 has returned to normal levels. So, we were questioning whether or not the phosphorylation of MDM2 in response to acute exercise could put a break on uh, FOXO1 um, functions. So, what we did is that first we observed that a certain number of exercise-like stimulus will induce the phosphorylation of MDM2 in primary um, endothelial cells. 
And where we were overexpressing a phosphomimetic for MDM2 in these cells, we will see that there was an increased binding between MDM2 and FOXO in the endothelial cells. And this was associated uh, with a down regulation of some of FOXO1 target genes. So when we overexpress this phosphomimetic that has a constitutively active function of MDM2, we'll see a down regulation of genes such as protein 2. Uh, genes coding for P27, thrombospondin 1, etc. So why was that potentially important? It's because when we deleted FOXO1 in the endothelial cells, and if uh, we were making those mice performing an acute beta exercise, the acute beta exercise was not able to upregulate thrombospondin 1 expression uh, if FOXO1 was uh, depleted in the endothelium of those mice. And uh, more interestingly, even so, we were thinking that it's important because when FOXO1 is downregulated in those endothelial cells, there is an early onset of exercise driven angiogenesis in these mice. So when I thought about that, I was thinking, oh, MDM2 might be important to make sure that there is a timely regulation of angiostatic genes, and indeed, through down-regulating FOXO function, we were getting a down-regulation of the expression of the genes that were downstream of FOXO1. So I was thinking, should I push that further as an independent researcher to try to find out whether or not MDM2 has other silencing functions? So that's what brought uh, me to want to investigate some of the pathways that are important for the maturation of mere RNAs. And actually, we had some evidence that shown that potentially MDM2 through its interaction with drosha could potentially lead to a selective maturation of angiomeres. And I want to talk about that now. So on the left here, what you see here is a simplified version of uh, what is the canonical pathways of mere biogenesis machinery here. So as you might know, um, mere RNA are first transcribed as pri uh, mirrors, and they are cleaved by drosha, and drosha um, then that leads to the formation of precursor mirrors that are then exported into the cytoplasms and further cleaves uh, with dicer. And when those, uh, when dicer has acted on those precursor mirrors, we have a major mRNA, a mirror RNA, sorry, that has the potential to repress the translation of multiple targets. So this is a very, very useful, mirrors, mirrors are really useful tools to silence genes in general in the cells. Um, interestingly, there was work that was done by Stephanie Dimler um, a long time ago showing that drosha was really important for the maturation of angiomeres and could play a role in regulating angiogenic genes. So we thought it was interesting to pursue some investigation in that direction. So as you know, there is a lot of work that's been done in the field of exercise physiology showing that uh, endurance uh, exercise leads to a differential regulation of mirrors, but there's a lot less known regarding whether or not uh, the mechanisms of the mirror biogenesis machineries uh, are important or not in the context of, uh, of exercise. So I don't have, we haven't done much work regarding that yet, and uh, Brian Lam was doing his PhD in the lab in, in co and co-supervised with Dr. Bureau is is performing some experiment regarding that right now. But what we know from his master work is that um, when we, the wool, the wool skeletal muscle drosha protein level seems to be sensitive to nutrient availability. And indeed, when you compare uh, mice that have different um, resting blood glucose level, so using wild type mice and DDDB diabetic mice and heterozygote mice, that were provided by Dr. As, we observed that uh, there's a negative correlation between drosha and the resting blood glucose. So in vitro, of course, when we treated the cells with um, different concentration of, of glucose, um, I'm just showing like really low and high glucose concentration, but Brian did some um, dose effect analysis. 
we can see that with high glucose, we are decreasing hydrosha protein level, and this was associated with an increased binding with MDM2. But we were more interested in knowing whether or not MDM2 could potentially uh, support the maturations of, of angiomeres because MDM2 has some um, RNA binding, is capable of binding RNAs directly. So what we did is that we treated once again those primary endothelial cells with high and low glucose and we measure uh, the transcript of proangiogenic and angiostatic mirrors. Uh, and also the mature forms. While with high glucose we see a decrease of uh, drosh expressions, we wouldn't see any tendencies towards a decrease of the mature form of the mirrors. It wasn't significant. But what was quite surprising is to observe that uh, mir 15A was actually uh, significantly uh, upregulated. And um, we performed some studies and we used, for example, um, chemical inhibitors of MDM2, Nutlin 3, and we could see that when we treated the cells with that inhibitor, we will see um, uh, completely preventions of the upregulation of mir 15 a So we are thinking that the increased binding between MDM2 and Drosha, or at least somehow, MDM2 could play an important role in, in controlling the selective maturation of mir 15 as in those endothelial cells. So, um, from, we know that Drosha plays a role in controlling the angiogenic balance and could potentially have an impact on the expression of thrombospondin 1 and VGFA, but at this stage we don't know whether or not this is important for exercise, like um, for the response to exercise and exercise training. And really, we don't know what is the role of the biogenesis machinery in the muscle cells or in the endothelial cells in response to exercise. Still, we have some preliminary data, and Brian has a poster about that today, where he's going to, uh, uh, where he has seen that the contractile activities in the myotubes can potentially increase uh, the expression of drosha. This might potentially impact, because those are very preliminary data, what type of mirrors RNA we might find in vesicles. And then when you treat the cells with those vesicles, you can see some change in the endothelial cells proliferation. So I would invite you to visit Brian's poster if you want to know more about it. So if I have the time, I would like to present then the third part of my talk. This is the least advanced work that we do right now. Uh, so. This is related to studying the pathway of gene silencing through epigenetic marks. Um, I know you probably went to the epigenetic session yesterday, and that was a really great session, actually, I thought. Uh, we know that with acute exercise, uh, we change the distribution of the DNA methylations. And yesterday, all these guys in the session were focusing on metabolic adaptation rather than androgenic adaptations. But... Um, with an acute bad of exercise, we know that we have hypomethylations um, after exercise. And because it's been shown by, by, by groups that there is an hypomethylation on genes that are co-activators, such as PGC1 alpha or PPAR gamma, we know that this potentially could impact uh, the expression of, um, of pro genes such as VGF, right? But what is happening in response to uh, endurance training? When you look at, uh, for example, in mice, um, it's a work that's been published here by other investigators, we can see that when they measure differential gene expressions and DNA methylation in the same study, the change in the DNA methylation can only explain about 7.5% of the change in gene expression when the muscle are collected four hours post-exercise. But when you look at, for example, in human studies, uh, we can see that the change in DNA methylation on, at basal levels on the muscle at rest, comparing trained versus untrained, about the DNA methylation explains only 14.5% of the change in gene expressions. So this question whether or not there could be other mechanisms involved and potentially could it be due to histone modifications. 
Of course, uh, those big groups have already investigated that, and you can see that when you look at activation of histone marks, such as H3K27 acetylation or H3K4 trimethylation, which are known as being histone activation marks associated with gene activations, uh, it's been shown that there are enrichment uh, of those activation marks in some gene enhancers uh, that could be important for angiogenesis, such as genes that regulate extracellular matrix reorganizations. But when you look at the ontology analysis of some of those publications, you could see that there are some angiogenic processes that are present in the differentially expressed genes, but they are not present when you look at DNA methylation necessarily. So that would be interesting to, uh, to investigate other type of histone marks, and that's what we want to do in the lab. What we want to do is really to study um, the histone silencing mark, those marks are potentially important to um, generate what we call fac facultative repressive chromatins. So, um, in the lab, we were interested in knowing whether or not um, the pathway important for establishing those marks are sensing exercise or not. So, but if you think about histone 3, which is part of the core histones, we know that the polycom repressive complex 2 and especially EZH2, which is the methyl transferase that is actually catalyzing the trimethylation of lysine 27 onto histone 3. Uh, we know that uh, it's leading to that, and so it's leading to the establishment of the facultative heterochromatin. But then, like afterwards, the polycom repressive complex 1 can lead to a further uh, silencing or remodeling of the chromatin to get an heterochromatin through uh, the ubiquitination of histone 2A. But what is interesting and why we, were, we wanted to study that specific types of, epi, of histone modification, it's because it's a facultative heterochromatin. And what I mean by that is, even if you have H3K27 trimethylations, it's quite easy, more easily to return to an uh, active conformation of the chromatin if you add acetylation marks on the histone 3 or even um, ubiquitination mark on the chromatin. So it's a more flexible way of transient silencing of genes, potentially. So we know that MDM2, from the work of other groups, can interact with EZH2 and has been shown to enhance uh, the capacity of EZH2 to put a trimethylation on lysine 27 of H3. And when you look at the supplemental data of their work, they have observed that when they knock down MDM2, uh, in MEF cells, so in muscle embryonic fibroblasts, they are able to observe a silencing of some androgenic genes that is associated with the change in the abundance of the H3K27 marks. What we know from some premium data we have in the lab that were generated by Soka Inan, she has a poster as well, uh, is that when we are using an inhibitor of EZH2, uh, we, of course, see a decrease of the trimethylation in the primary skeletal muscle and the TLDR cells, but we also see an upregulation of KDR, suggesting that some of those mechanisms could take place in primary skeletal muscle and the TLDR cells, not just in MEF cells. So we are at the early stage of our investigations, but what we know is that in the skeletal muscle, EZH2 binds to MDM2, and we know that when we perform repeated but acute exercise, we can see some change in the phosphorylation of EZH2. And that phosphorylation that we measure on the treonin 311 is associated with a reduced capacity for EZH2 to catalyze uh, the histone marks. So we are thinking that when we look at what happened in the skeletal muscle with the acute put of exercise, there may be an increased activity of EZH2 through uh, the reduction of the phosphorylation of the threonine uh, 311. So we also look at what happened with long-term uh, uh, endurance training, and we see an increase of the abundance of EZH2 and MDM2. There was some uh, significant downregulation of KDR with training, surprisingly, and there was some um, change in uh, genes, it was not significant, but it was a, a trend towards a decrease. 
and we measure um, multiple histone 3 modifications, and I'm just highlighting two of them here. We measure H3K27. Surprisingly, it was mostly more abundant at 25 kilodalton band rather than 17 kilodalton band. So, but we've seen that 25 kilodalton band was, was upregulated with training. And uh, we, we performed uh, some immunoprecipitation and some mass spect, and we know that the 25 kilodalton band that we detect, we find histone 3, in the, we find peptide, there are markers of histone 3, of ubiquitin, so we are thinking, where we were questioning whether or not that 25 kilodalton band could be an ubiquitin. Um, interestingly, with endurance training, we didn't see any change in the abundance of H2K, uh, the ubiquitin form of it. So this is letting us to question whether or not um, there would be some change in the enrichment of marks that will um, promote facultative heterochromatin uh, formations in uh, angiogenic genes. So at this stage, we haven't been moving forward too much yet. We have some few target genes that we want to investigate doing cheap PCR assays uh, from analyzing uh, genome-wide um, genome-wide data from other groups. So we have a few targets that we are going to look at what type of epigenetic mark we find on those genes, on the promoter and the enhancer, whether or not there's change in those marks. And we are also, um, we have also samples that will go um, through a cheap seek to find out if we change the distributions of those marks uh, in the future. So that's where we are right now uh, with the lab of the work. Um, so if I want to summarize, and I know it's kind of difficult, I think that with the acrylbat of exercise, we know that potentially the protein-protein interaction, at least what we see with MDM2 and FOXO1, could be important in, in leading to transient downregulation of some angiogenic genes. Uh, all the work that's been done by other groups showing the hypomethylations proposed that, propose that acute exercise could help opening the chromatin. But I think we need to question whether or not once that we have those hypomethylation, do we give the opportunity for other systems to get in to establish or to change the, the positioning of silencing marks to establish new facultative repressive marks, either post-exercise and during short-term training. And finally, with the long-term training, we might question whether or not we have higher expression of EZH2, MDM2, and also other histone modifier we have NET4, for example, that is also upregulated, could be useful to maintain those facultative repressive marks, and whether or not uh, once those marks are there, for example, the H3 recutination, is it going to be easier to reactivate genes that have those marks, maybe in the context of the training and training. And I know that Mark is going to talk about the training in a minute. Uh, so I'm just going to stop here, and I want to thank all the people that were involved in this work. So there's past and current member in my lab, and I just want to highlight again that Sokain and Brian have two posters here today. Uh, a lot of the work that I presented for the first part of my talk were done when I was an associate researcher in Tyrus Lab, and that was Dara that did a lot of the work that was there. Uh, and um, Brian is in the second part. Most of the work was done with Brian, but also with Emmanuel. And Brian is in co-supervision with Dr. Biro. And I want to thank also Al uh, Dr. Ali Abdul Sater um, Lab, and especially Mayuri, because at the time I couldn't exercise mice. Uh, their lab were providing us with um, trained muscle samples, so that was really useful. And I want to thank all the other collaborators. We had access to human biopsy. Uh, a while ago with uh, collaboration with Thomas Gustafsson, uh, Mark for providing some of the VGF knockout mice, and Marilyn Perry that at the time uh, uh, helped us getting the hypomorphic mice for MDM2. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Questions? Um, thank you, that nice talk. I had a question, I wanted to ask your opinion how the relative importance, in your opinion, of the MDM2 pathways and silencing of genes in the muscle fiber itself, which may be then silencing angiogenic promoter th promoting factors as opposed to changes in the endothelial cell themselves, 
since you went back, some of your in vitro work was in endothelial cells, but then your bulk assays of, of epigenetic changes are probably in the muscle fibers. So could you tell us where the gene silencing you think is really most important in inhibiting capillarization with prolonged training? I actually don't know. I, 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 I'm, I, I don't know. Like, for sure, when you think about FOXO1 and that the, that would be mostly in the endothelia cells, but for the silencing part, role of MDM2, MDM2 is, is necessary in all cells. Otherwise, they, they wouldn't be able to survive, right? Because you would get too much of the P53 activation and you get massive apoptosis, so you need that. But um, where would be the most important? I guess... If you think about generating those, those, um, those maybe it depends on the engineering factors we are looking at, I, I would think. So it, maybe for VEGF it would be highly important in the myofibers, but I think, I think it's interesting to look at it in endothelia cells because I think they can change more easily phenotype. So I think from that perspective, if I think if we are thinking about making the chromatin more flexible in terms of phenotype, we know that the endothelia cells to perform engineering, they need to change phenotype. So I would think it would be more interesting to look at that in that perspective. But we're going to try to look at it both if we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. Um, like, I'm just uh, fascinated by the number of proteins that MDM2 interacts with, okay, with the drosia, with the, meti uh, me um, mm -hmm. the metallase that you're looking at with regards to uh, uh, chromatin modification. And I'm just wondering, it's a ligase, right? So does it ubiquitinate all of this protein that it interacts with, or what is the function now? I mean, what does it do you know, with regards to its interaction if it is not ubiquitinating some of those uh, substrates? And also if you can comment on its localization because uh, I don't know whether it's nuclear only and then all of the substrates are as well are in the nucleus or if they are fine elsewhere. So MDM2 has been reporting to interact with a lot of proteins, but most of the data are done on cancer cells that have amplification of MDM2. So, of course, if you have amplification of MDM2 gene 200 times, you are going to increase the potential for a binding partner. So we will need to confirm that all of those interactions are, are actually taking place in the normal cells that doesn't have an amplification of MDM2. But, so if I get back to your questions, uh, so MDM2 doesn't just do ubiquitination. It's usually prime... Uh, it usually just primes those proteins for monoubiquitination, and after that you need other actors to move on with that. But if you look at the work that is the most advanced regarding MDM2 and P53, for example, we know that MDM2 could uh, inhibit P53 just by binding, and it's going to remove P53 from, from, from transcriptional sites and things like that, for example. Um, but MDM2 is, is highly regulated, and which protein is going to interact with is going to vary depending on the cell type. There are more, I think there are 42 sites of post-translational modification of MDM2 that are regulated by different pathways. So I'm thinking that if you think about muscle cells versus endothelial cells, for sure MDM2 is not going to interact with the same proteins probably, and it would be context dependent as well. So it's ubiquitin, so it's not, it's not specific because you find MDM2 everywhere but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a differential regulation, different cell type. And I don't know what was the second part of the question. Localization. Oh, the localization. I'm more interested by the nuclear localization of MDM2. People have been studying the cytoplasmic localization of MDM2 because it can interact with receptors. But I'm, I'm more interested in the nuclear localization of MDM2 because I think it could be localized in sites where either you have DNA damage or you have active active um, transcriptions. So uh, it's going to be located in the very discrete domains within the chromatin. And I think once it's there, it's well positioned to interact either with transcription factor, co-activators, or even element of, uh, of uh, the mere 
uh, biogenesis machinery. So I think if we were going hardcore and doing cell biology, we will need to really study how MDM2 interacts with the chromatin. But there are other groups that are doing that, and I've shown that MDM2 is found on the chromatin and does a lot of transcriptional regulation within the chromatin. There is a group in Montpellier that does hardcore uh, cell biology regarding that. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Emily. We're going to move on to our final speaker of the session.